Ladies and gentlemen, please rise and welcome the president of the Kavli Foundation, Rockel Hankin. The president of the Norwegian Science and Letters, Lisa Övre Ors, and the Kavli Prize laureates. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the King of Norway, His Majesty King Harald V.
Your Majesty. Your Majesty. Your Excellencies, dear prize laureates, and ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to welcome you to this wonderful ceremony, the Kavli Prizes in Nanoscience, Astrophysics, and Neuroscience, the smallest, the largest, and the most complex. The Kavli Prize is a partnership between the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters, the Kavli Foundation, and the Norwegian Ministry of Education and Research. The prize was initiated by the late Mr. Fred Kavli and is today being awarded for the eighth time, the 2022 awards. And Jim, it's really a huge pleasure for me to be here in Oslo Concert Hall to present these fantastic awards. And I feel both uh, safe and honored to have you by my side. I'm certain we have some amazing moments and experiences ahead of us. Thank you, Guri. Well, of course, the honor is all mine. When I was first invited to co-host this ceremony and meet these wonderful Cavalier laureates, it really didn't take me long to decide. And of course, I've been following this event since its beginning in 2008. Fred Kavli established the prize in Norway in order to recognize outstanding scientific research and to promote public understanding and support for scientists and their work. The award really embodies his own personal drive for increased knowledge, new knowledge, and the strive for excellence something that I believe that all of us scientists at least try to do. But, Gri, I believe you grew up in Fred Kavli's neighborhood. I did. It's the most beautiful part of Norway. He was from a little village called uh, Adesfjord on the magnificent northwest coast of Norway, Nad Undalsnes. Fred started out quite young. He was only 14 when he set up his first company. He moved to the U.S. in his 20s, but he remained Norwegian in his spirit his whole life. He certainly did, but it was in the States that he became successful as an inventor and a businessman. And that's where he built his fortune that enabled him to pursue this wonderful mission to establish scientific research at the heart of culture and society. Because throughout his life, he really had this enormous passion and enthusiasm for science. But Jim, since you are a professor of theoretical physics, what is it that puzzled your mind the most about this vast universe we live in? Green, many things puzzle me in life. For example, why anyone in the United Kingdom ever thought it was a good idea to vote for Boris Johnson. Mm -hmm. But I guess you mean in physics. <laughs> Well, my current research in physics is into the nature of time itself in, in the quantum world, why time has a past and a future, why there's a direction. That's very deep. Let's not talk about that anymore now. What deep mysteries move you? Well, for me, nature is wondrous, and everything in nature is connected. When I'm looking at the mountains in my home place, I feel that I belong to something bigger than me. The sun and the moon affects the tides, and the flowers know when spring has come. And the flamingos, which are naturally gray, they eat an algae that turns them pink. And for me, all these overwhelming connections are awe-inspiring. Well, for all of you here today, we have with us an awe-inspiring group of scientists whose research achievements have been at the very highest level. We may not get all the answers to all our questions, but I can promise you that we will all leave a little wiser and maybe knowing something new about the world. So, now on to the first prize. The Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters has established three international selection committees with members coming from Germany, France, the United Kingdom, America, China, Switzerland, Denmark, and Norway. And it is they who have decided the winners of the Kavli Prize. Each of the three prizes consists of a diploma, a gold medal, and one million in US dollars. The first prize will be for neuro nanoscience.
So, Jim, can you explain to us just how big is an atom? Or how small an atom? That's why we disappeared, because I had to think <laughs> about how to explain this. Atoms are really tiny. They are about one angstrom across, which is one-tenth of a millionth of a millimeter. Oh, well, good. Good, I'm sure everyone now has a very precise <laughs> understanding <laughs> on the size of an atom. Which is why I have this prop. So, imagine this football were expanded out to the size of the Earth. Okay, I think I got that. Okay, mm -hmm. so then every atom in the football would now be the size of a football. Wow, that's okay. incredible. So that's wow. small. Yeah. <laughs> well, the reason I asked was to bring us to our, to our first category. A major goal of nanoscience is to create materials, materials and devices assembled with atomic scale precision, giving us new invention that will benefit all of society. And this means, of course, that we have to understand materials down at the atomic scale. But to do this, to manipulate the very building blocks of matter, we have to be able to see what we're doing, to actually see atoms. And this is possible with electron microscopy. But there have been a great many challenges for this to be achieved. Not least, these microscopes must correct the problem called a spherical aberration, to be able to produce sharp images Something researchers have been struggling with since these uh, telescopes were invented in the 1930s. The four laureates in the Nanoscience 2020 category have all been central in their own way in developing aberration correcting lenses that make it possible in electron microscopes to see and analyze materials at the sub angstrom level. Harold Rose proposed a novel lens design, now called the Rose Corrector, which is essentially a clever arrangement of electromagnets that precisely manipulates the electron beam to give us much sharper images. Maximilian Heider for the realization of the first sextupole corrector based on Rose's design. Together with Knut Urban, they implemented the first, and listen now, the first aberration corrected conventional transmission electron microscope. I better repeat. <laughs> aberration corrected conventional transmission electron microscope. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> and last but not least, Andre Krivenik for the realization of the first aberration-corrected scanning transmission electron microscope with sub-angstrom resolution. Let's meet these four men in their home environment. I know somebody at Apple in California, at Apple you know, company, and he said, Dr. Rose, without your invention, the iPhone would not have the performance it has nowadays. The properties of matter, the properties of materials, which are later on used for technology, they are decided in the microstructure. And in the end, it's the interaction of atoms which, with each other which are responsible for the properties. So when uh, I think our era, the last uh, 20, 30 years, are characterized by going into the small and smallest dimensions uh, in order to tailor materials. The collaboration between Harold Rosa, Maximilian Haidar and Knut Orban started in earnest in the mid-1980s. There was a conference in uh, Austria and uh, Salzburg, which we three, Harald Rosa, Knut Orban and myself, attended. And we listened, uh, listened to, to the talks 
And there was one presentation by the Max Planck Institute of Stuttgart um, where they presented a new microscope they are just uh, purchasing and will be, should be installed in the near future, which uh, is 1.2 MeV microscope going down to, with resolution downwards to about one angstrom. And, but of course it's a unique instrument and it's very expensive. And Harald Rose started to complain just with a fraction of the cost of such a microscope, we could start the project to use a modern microscope, medium voltage microscope with 200 kilovolt, for example, and to compensate the circulation and to have the, about uh, at least the same resolution with uh, lower energy, which means also able to investigate beam-sensitive materials. Harold Rosa proposed in the late 1980s a novel lens design, the Rose Corrector, also known as the Hexapole Corrector enabling aberration correction in transmission electron microscopy. I knew the principles. I always uh, was good in mathematics, but without having a, a statistical insight, I never could use the mathematics. If, if you have to understand that that's the problem, and, and then you know how to go on to make approximations so that you get the result to a few percent, not exactly, but that you can show it will work and how the principle is, and then you can do it in a, this, the final design. Maximilian Haidar realized Harold Rolz's idea and designed the hexapole corrector. What you see here is just a, a magnetic hexapole element where the electrons then just to the center, which are passing by here in this hole, passing by, and they are. Uh, reacting due to the hexapole field. And it means that a round electron bundle would be uh, disturbed by a threefold asthmatism. That means we don't have a round bundle anymore. We have then a threefold shape of this electron bundle. And the important point is that one really could see uh, single atoms or interfaces at uh, different devices or different objects. That was really just a breakthrough, and that was actually, I would call it, revolutionary. Knut Orban, together with Max Heider, implemented the first aberration corrected conventional transmission electron microscope. The magnification which you can get in this way uh, is up to about a million uh, times. Now we have a development towards life science applications of this. That means the most exciting development in the moment is for me that biologists start to uh, use such aberration corrected instruments uh, in order to advance resolution in, in molecules. Molecular biology nowadays is close to atomic resolution, not, but not fully. That means you can, in a molecule, which normally has ten thousands of atoms, you cannot resolve the critical atom. Andrei Krivanek realized the first quadruple octopole aberration corrected scanning transmission electron microscope with sub angstrom resolution. Essentially, we want to make every single electron that goes through the microscope produce some useful signal. And we can do that nowadays. And so we want to capture the electron, we want to tag its energy, uh, we want to collect a whole bunch of them, and we want to process the images in innovative ways so you can pick up signals that uh, the raw imaging would not give you. Uh, mathematical processing can find out all kinds of signals. Still, it's important to have good optics. So that's where the correctors come in. Our type of microscope makes a tiny little probe and scans it around on the sample. And the probe itself, where it's focused, is actually like typically half the size of an atom, sometimes even smaller than that. To produce the tiny little probe, we can't use uh, round uh, magnetic lenses because they have unavoidable aberrations. This is something that's been known since 1936, and the solutions were proposed in 1948 by a very smart German professor, Otto Scherzer, that's kind of like one of the fathers of this field and we simply follow one of his recipes. 
people had been trying for 50 years before it actually worked. So it got a little bit complicated, uh, but if you do it right, it can, can be made to work. And that's kind of the, the big advance in microscopy, working aberration correctors. Please welcome on stage Harold Rosa, Maximilian Haider, Knut Orban and Andre Krivanek. Jim, would you say that the nano-universe we were just inside has uh, something in common with our great cosmos? Mm, yes, very clever. In fact, the instruments we use to study both have actually a lot in common. I suppose you mean that if we turn a microscope 180 degrees, we can look out into space through the most impressive telescope we have today. Just two months ago, the incredible James Webb telescope sent its first images back to Earth. And look at this. It's like a beautiful work of art. Mm. But Jim, these telescopes are like time machines, aren't they? Yes, that's, that's very true, actually. In fact, the, the James Webb Telescope can see so far out into the universe that what it's seeing is how the universe was a long time ago. So the image we can all see here on the right is, in fact, the very first one that the James Webb Telescope sent back to us. It's of a cluster of thousands of galaxies. So every dot isn't a star, it's a galaxy. And it shows the universe as it was very lo a long time in the past. In fact, it's taken light almost five billion years to reach our telescopes. And so we're seeing the universe as it was when the Earth was first being formed. And the other thing to say about this is that it shows a patch of sky so small that you could block it off with a grain of sand held at arm's length. Quite incredible. That's incredible. Whew. Wow, well, while the James Webb sees light in the infrared region, X-ray astronomy has granted us access to the unimaginably hot and energetic forces of the universe. The Kavli Prize laureates in Astrophysics 2020 is one of the most prolific and influential astronomers of our time. Through his groundbreaking research in the field of observational X-ray astronomy, he has been a leading person among several major research areas. Together with his team, Andrew Fabian has contributed to a far better understanding of the connection between galaxies, black holes, and the gases that bind the universe together. So, let's get to know him a little bit better and see 
what has occupied his mind the last decades. One of the major things, I think, of my work over the last several decades is the realization that uh, black holes play a very large part in the evolution of galaxies. And this was not realized 30 years ago. The, the, generally, people thought of massive black holes at the centers of galaxies as being some sort of ornamental bauble that is right at the center, like the, the fairy on the Christmas tree. Um, but what it is, is uh, it appears to be, is something that controls the whole evolution of the gas in the galaxy and therefore of the appearance of the galaxy. It affects the star formation and, and everything else. Black hole produces so much energy and so much momentum in its radiation that it can actually control the whole the behavior of the gas in the whole galaxy or the center of a cluster of galaxies. When I talk about clusters, I'm not talking about the whole cluster, I'm talking about the central 10% of it. But nevertheless, that can be controlled by a black hole at the center of the central galaxy. And the ratio of the size of the region that's being controlled to the size of the black hole is roughly the ratio of the size of the Earth to the size of an orange. So we've got something the size of an orange controlling something the size of the Earth. The mass ratio is, is a thousand to one, a thousand, whereas the mass ratio between the Earth and an orange is <laughs> much, much larger. How do black holes occur? Actually, what happens is you get a star which is more than, say, 30 times the mass of the Sun uh, evolves and it, it, it lasts only about a million years due to uh, you know, fusion of energy, hydrogen to helium to carbon to oxygen and so forth. And you can't go any further than iron and getting energy out of such processes. And eventually the core of the star reaches that state and collapses inwards. Gravity takes over and collapses inwards. And if the star and the core of the star is massive enough, it can collapse down and form a black hole. There's nothing can stop it. So the core of the star, that's the inner few solar masses collapses inwards, while actually there's an enormous energy release as it collapses inwards, there's a lot of release of gravitational energy, and, and that's going to fling the rest of the star away, and that's a supernova explosion. And so as far as we know, that's how black holes are formed. Then they grow by either merging with other black holes or by matter falling into them, and they build up like that. There are still puzzles as to how on earth we grow the billion solar mass black holes. Because in certain ways, uh, there isn't time for them to build up that large. And that's currently a, a frontier question in astrophysics. Research at this level seems to most of us almost unreal. How do you approach these cosmological questions? I feel that serendipity is very important in science. Um, and serendipity in the sense of Pasteur, that chance favours a prepared mind, OK? And, uh, you know, people, other people have said what's uh, the most exciting thing in science is not saying Eureka, um, but actually saying, mm, that's strange. <laughs> and, you know, I, the thing is, we get lots of that strange almost every day, and usually it's because somebody's, <laughs> even yourself, uh, even me, you know, have done something wrong. Uh, but sometimes you get things that really don't fit, and that leads to important things. But you need to have your mind prepared to know what's right and what's wrong and what shouldn't be there to be able to work out what's funny. What are the big questions today? There are two very large questions. What is dark matter and uh, what is dark energy? Most of the mass in the universe is actually dark. We don't know what it is. It could be one small particle. It could be lots of particles. It could be lots of primordial black holes. I don't know. We don't know what it is. All we know is we can feel the gravitational effect but we can't actually detect it. It doesn't interact with electromagnetic radiation or have any electric 
or magnetic form. There are things we know exist in the universe, or maybe we're wrong about that, maybe they don't exist, but they're really big questions. Most of the matter in the universe is made out of something which doesn't interact with us other than through gravity. What is it? And somebody might tell us next week, they might not tell us for a hundred years. Please welcome on stage Andrew Fabian. So, Jim, here I have a red, nice chili pepper. If I gave you, say, 50 euros, would you dare to take a bite? I, I, I probably would accept the challenge, but probably not on stage in front of all these people, <laughs> just in case it's a bit too uncomfortable for me. Okay, <laughs> okay. But did you know that if you were to take a bite, it's not your senses of taste that will respond? What you will be responding to is the pain. Yes, in fact, it's very interesting because in chili peppers, there's a chemical component called capsaicin, which is very strong and irritating. It triggers the same proteins that react if, for example, you touch a hot stove. And this substance, capsaicin, has made it possible to find out what happens when the body is exposed to heat. And then there are other proteins that react to cold. And these proteins have been found to also react to plants that produce cooling agents, such as uh, menthol and peppermints. Our skin is a wonderfully fine-tuned sensory instrument with nerve cells directly connected to our brains. Like, for example, when I lightly touch another person or if I get a hard slap on the face, uh, there are two very different stimuli but both activate a molecule called a piezo protein. Mm. And it's a protein found in the skin all over the body. Piezo also have a very special role when it comes to our awareness and control over our body's movements. We call it proprioception. If I close my eyes and try to hit the tip of my nose with my index finger, I wouldn't be able to do it without this protein, piezo. And so, the 2020 Kavli Prize in Neuroscience is awarded to two outstanding scientists, David Julius and Ardem Pataputian. Their discoveries have revolutionized the field of molecular, and the field by providing a molecular and neural basis for both thermosensation, the perception of temperature stimuli, and mechano sensation, mechanical stimuli, giving us a better understanding of pain sensing, discoveries that are helping in the development of new treatments. So Jim, let's learn a little bit more about our sensory system. Studying sensory systems is a really unique aspect of biology because, um, you know, Every creature sees the world in a different way. 
You know, we see the world in a different way than a honeybee or a snake, and that really depends upon the, you know, the biophysical and molecular sensors that we have in our bodies that interpret all these signals from our environment and then convert this information that our brain can kind of reconstruct as our world. Over the last few decades, we have learned a lot about how we see, smell, taste. Uh, of course, smelling and tasting is all based on chemical sensing. And this is actually the language that uh, most of our cells in our bodies use to communicate with each other. But the somatosensation, which is sense of touch, pain, proprioception, etc., all of these depend on sensing physical stimuli, which is very different. So how do you sense temperature? How do you sense pressure? And translate this into a language that neurons understand, which is an electrical signal, was not known. It was known that these specialized uh, proteins called ion channels exist, but their identity was not known. So my lab has found ion channels responsible for pressure and earlier work in, in temperature. What your skin is sensing is the indentation. So anytime you touch, your skin is being indented. What's really fascinating is we say there's the sensor in the skin, but actually most of the sensing is happening at this very, very thin, very long projection of a sensory neuron that starts in the back of your spinal cord. This neuron sends processes everywhere in your body, including the skin. And at the tips of these neurites, there are sub-micrometer in length sits this tiny, tiny ion channel, which is in nanometers length, that when the plasma membrane, which is the fatty surrounding of a cell that protects the cell, there's this little protein sitting there. And this protein um, is, is, as you can see here, is a molecule that comes with three identical members in different colors. They come together and sit in the membrane shown in this green color, and they actually bend the plasma membrane. This piezo-2 protein, there's two of them, we call them piezo-1 and 2, are proteins that are encoded by DNA, and so a gene. So there's this gene that its only role is to make a protein that sits in a few cell types on the membrane, and its only job is to sense pressure. And when the cell gets pushed or dented, they flatten. And when this flattens, conformation of the protein changes and ions start flowing through this protein. And when that happens, you have the first signal that starts the process that we call touch. What molecules in our body react to heat and cold? At least as far as we know, most of these molecules belong to the same family of membrane proteins, these ion channels called trip channels which are actually first discovered in flies, in fruit flies. But in mammals, um, a number of them, different ones, and we don't know yet which, all the ones that contribute to temperature sensation, but at least two of the ones that we've looked at, the receptor for chili peppers, for capsaicin, and the receptor for menthol, these TRIP-V1 and TRIP-MA channels, they belong, they're sort of molecular cousins in the same gene family, and one of them senses heat and one of them senses cold. So this is a model of the capsaicin receptor. This hole in the middle, opens up like a donut hole, and it allows ions to flow down their what we call electrochemical gradient. So outside there's a lot of sodium ions, and the sodium ions rush into the cell, and you know the currency of communication in the nervous system is electricity. So when ions are flowing across the membrane like that, it generates an electrical current, and then this excites the neuron. That initial excitation is then carried along the neuron, say from your finger, all the way along into your spinal cord, that information gets relayed to another neuron that carries that ultimately to your brain. Your ability to recognize something hot or cold is determined by the biophysical properties of this protein, which is really kind of a magnificent thing. Right? Our route to discovering that was a little bit indirect in that we didn't ask, we didn't go in first asking what are the molecules that sense temperature. We asked what are the molecules that sense these pungent agents, you know, these natural products, menthol, Cap, first capsaicin and then menthol. And, and with capsaicin, we identified this channel, and we knew it was going to likely be important for some aspect of pain sensation, but we didn't really know what the endogenous normal activator, physiologic activator might be. So we threw all kinds of things at it that we thought made sense in the context of pain, 
like neuropeptides, neurotransmitters, and didn't really find anything that seemed to be consequential. And so then we decided, you know, our paint system does more than detect chemicals. It detects physical forces like touch or temperature. And so we tried changing temperature. Coal didn't do anything to the capsaicin receptor, but heat did. And so we realized that we had, that the capsaicin receptor and the heat receptor were the same. And you know, in retrospect, of course, everybody thinks we made the connection right away because you eat a chili pepper. And, um, but it didn't have to be that way. It could just be that they're on the same cells and you activate the same pathway. Uh, and so that was kind of a, you know, eureka moment when we realized that this is kind of a, a very parsimonious explanation for your everyday experience. Among sensory systems, I always say, I think the somatic sensation and pain is probably the one that's most important for our survival and well-being. Because if you don't have it, you really have trouble knowing, you know, learning how to avoid things that can be injurious. Please welcome on stage David Julius and Ardem Pataputian. For the four Kevli laureates in the nanoscience this year, this year has looked to nature. And for me, nature is endlessly fascinating, especially how it adapts. Just look at this leaf, for example, and see just how the water drops off. Hmm. It, it is incredible. It's something we take for granted, I think, how leaves are, are shaped and evolved to carry the water down to the bottom of the plant. But it's actually very, very complicated. The four Kavli laureates in nanoscience this year have, in different ways, copied nature, developing molecular-scale coatings of surfaces. For centuries, scientists have been puzzling over how to change surface properties. For example, how do you make a piece of glass repel water, just like the leaf did? And how do you protect metal from harsh chemicals? Self-assembled monolayers on the surfaces of materials are coatings that are just a single layer of molecules thick and which allow us to control surface properties. And it's all around us. We benefit from it every day. The concept of organized monolayer films was introduced back in the 1930s and was further developed in the decades that followed. Jacob Sagiv built on these observations and demonstrated conclusively in 1980 that certain molecules could form well-defined monolayer films on some surfaces. In plain English, he showed that certain molecules could be made to stick to certain surfaces to give materials some very useful and novel properties. Ralf Nutzow and David Alara demonstrated the first self-assembled monolayers strongly bound to bare metal surfaces using particular molecules to create ordered two-dimensional self-assemblies on highly crystalline gold films. George Whitesides and his team were responsible for many innovations that established self-assembled monolayers, or SAMs, as a subfield of nanoscience and nanoengineering, with all sorts of applications from electronics through to medicine. Wow, I would like to meet these guys. 
What nature has done for millions of years, I suppose, is assemble molecules, uh, those kinds of molecules which are basic, basic components of fat called lip lipids. These kinds of molecules, hydrocarbon type molecules, assemble naturally in uh, biological substances, in plants. And so it's well known that they can for even form thin films, often freestanding films. When we entered the area of pursuing these self-assembly processes, what we did that was different was to cause the molecules to self-assemble on a flat surface of interest. Something nature wouldn't do simply because that flat surface was of no interest in biological processes. Jacob turned to silicon and Ralph and I, when we started originally, turned to gold. Not purposefully, but discovering by accident that in fact you could self-assemble molecules that on gold surfaces. So the self-assembly itself is nature's trip for millions of years. Our part was to discover it in a new uh, situation that we created. We created the pieces and nature did the rest. What we've done now is we've like said that, you know, the, the properties that we need are things that can be, uh, in, you know, instill, you know, basically constructed in, in, in objects by design. We can manipulate things purposefully as to composition, form, dynamics, etc., and, and use that beneficially towards, you know, towards uh, uh, particular desired applications. And, and that's the part of it that I think that's become particularly enabling. Um, from a technology perspective. It is possible to uh, affect a design at, at a very high level and classes of materials which, you know, would have been like Im impossible to envision, you know, working with, you know, in that context. So there's been a lot of evolution. I don't mean to trivialize all the contributions I think go into it, but, you know, we started with like understanding surfaces and interfaces. And then we, you know, based on lots of different contributions, went to how to do, you know, fabrication and patterning. And, you know, and then people were thinking top down, bottom up approaches to doing fabrication. And, and as you do all that, you know, the, the footprint gets bigger and bigger, like all the time, you know, and, and what would have been like an, an audacious, impossible aspiration, you know, like at the outset actually becomes not that, you know, unimaginable as the sophistication of what you're doing just expand, you know, in, in result of the work. Sam's was like a start in that process, but it's really uh, gone far and beyond, I, I think, uh, where you know, we started in, in 1980, at least like, you know, where, where I started in 1980. Surfaces are so important and so ubiquitous throughout technology and human use that wherever you can find a surface, you can ask a question, which can be scientific or can be technological. And self-assembled model layers are helpful to you in understanding that. And I think it's probably that that is ultimately the the key to use of these things, because what they do is to make it possible to vary the properties of surfaces at command relatively simply. You simply dip the surface that you're interested in in a solution containing the molecules that absorb on the surface, and self-assembly will generate the structure you're interested in. The limits to self-assembled wrong layers are that most of the molecules that are used right now are pretty simple molecules. You can make more complicated ones, but when you make more complicated ones, then the technology becomes more complicated. And one of the virtues is that we, in particular, really believe as a principle of doing research that to make good science into good technology, it's easiest if everything is very simple. So there's a lot to be said for just thinking about simplicity as a guiding principle in research. And if you're trying to make something that's modify surface properties at 2,000 degrees, or you're trying to make um, surfaces that are uh, amenable to um, 
extreme x-ray exposures or whatever, that's hard to do and that's going to require more work. I claim that our research, what we are doing, is leading itself. What I mean, you start with something, eventually discover something that you didn't think about. I mean, you, you, you had some idea, but not necessarily what came out of it. And this leads you to the next step. And then again, it can go in different directions. So actually the research leads itself if you have an open mind. The best thing that can happen is that something doesn't work according to your original idea. Good things come out of this, what is called serendipity. But you have to have a prepared mind and of course if you don't work on something you cannot discover. You have to, to work on something that may lead you to the discovery. But you cannot plan the discovery. But once it's there you have to recognize it. And then you have to work hard to prove that what you think is there, it's indeed there. And it's not a fake. All this is a game, actually. You have to let people playing, you know. There are different kinds of science. You can work for a certain purpose, to make a certain device, you know, applied science. And this is, is okay, it's fine. And you, you get also satisfaction if you manage to do something useful. But to discover something new or to come across something you didn't expect, it's very exciting. And so we are actually, I think that all my life I was playing science and this was more or less a hobby. The work was only how to get the means to do the hobby. I think forward looking, I think the applications in, in biomedical contexts are really quite interesting and they're, they're the ones that I'm most interested in at this point in time. When you start working with living things, you know, the first thing you have to uh, come to understand is they, they do have, you know, a mind of their own. And almost everything that you can do, you know, to perturb a system, you know, perturbs the system. It's very complex. Please welcome on stage Jakob Sargiv, Ralph Nutzo, representing David Alara, Paul Weiss and George Whitesides. Well, what, what a remarkable group of scientists. Yeah, and coping nature like that. Wow, very fascinating. It is, it is incredible. Well, as you can probably gather, we have another musical interlude. Uh, this time we have a talented young musician from Bergen uh, who is just as impressive as anyone you're likely to see today. That's right, the very gifted Iris. 
a genuine and fine-tuned voice inspired by dreams and the energy towards the west of Norway. Scientific research, and perhaps especially the creative research we honor here today, is incredibly exciting. Something I think all these great scientists have in common is that it's not what you look at that matters, it's what you see. We can all look up at a starry sky with or without a telescope and, and wonder at the, the, the immense magnificence of the heavens, but there are some of us today who see and hear more than the rest of us from outer space. Yes, they listen to the sound waves from the sun and other stars out there in the galaxy. All this to find out how the cosmos originated and what the sun and the stars are made of. And the eternal question of whether there is a basis for life similar to ours on other, other planets. Astro-seismology is the study of energy waves traveling through stars. Stars have many resonant modes and frequencies, and the path of sound waves passing through a star 
depends on the speed of the sound, which in turn depends on the star's local temperature and its chemical composition. Well, Jim, this sounds a little bit complicated, so before we go any further, <laughs> let's, li let's listen to an um, audio recording from the inside of the sun. Good idea. The original sound is, of course, far below what humans can hear because the waves are so spread out. They have a wavelength of several kilometers. But it has been modified so we can hear it. Okay, so can I hear it again, please? Okay, here is a different version. Well, very fascinating. Uh, of course, the atmosphere of a star is very noisy because of the turbulent motion of the star's gas. The amplified oscillations occur, for example, when the sound of an organ pipe resonates at just the right frequencies with its surroundings in a cathedral. One can perhaps think of an analogy by imagining that we are standing in the middle of a very loud noise, like being out on a runway when a jet plane takes off. But in that noise, there is a rather weak bell that emits perfectly regular tones. We are not able to perceive a single sound in that noise. But if there are a regular repetition of that sound, our brain could actually sense that it is a signal. And since the resulting frequencies of those sound waves inside a star are sensitive to different parts of the star, they provide astrophysicists with information about its internal structure. The 2022 Kavli Prize in Astrophysics is awarded to Connie Ertz, Jürgen Christensen Dahlsgård, and Roger Ulrich for their pioneering work and leadership in the development of helio and astroseismology. Their research has led the foundation of solar and stellar structure theory and revolutionized our understanding of the interiors of stars and how stars live their lives. So let's meet them. What I like about stars is, is the fact that we, we can study them in detail and we can apply physics to the study of stars and the study of exoplanets. In a sense, we can use the stars as laboratories for physics under very extreme conditions that we can't meet in, in, the, in the terrestrial laboratory. And the reason we can do that is that we can make very detailed observations of the internal properties of the stars. And that's really the, the field of research that I've been working on for my, my whole career. The fact that we can see waves on the stellar surfaces, just like we see waves in, in the Earth. And just like for the Earth, we can use those waves to do seismology of the interiors of the stars. So we can measure what conditions are inside the Sun in, in very great detail, in, in what we call helioseismology, and, and we can do similar things uh, in less detail for our stars. Well, helioseismology, it's the study of the uh, motions of the gas and how the waves that propagate through the sun uh, can tell us about the properties of the materials they're, they're passing through. So the, initially it was a matter of looking at the frequencies of the solar, the sun oscillating and trying to compare those frequencies with what models predict and trying to adjust the models so that they predicted the right frequencies. In addition, the gas in the sun drags the waves with it. If the gas in the sun and the wave are going in the same direction, then it tends to stretch out the wave in the direction that it's going. And if it's going in the opposite direction, it tends, it will compress the wavelengths, so you'll see them more 
uh, with a shorter wavelength. And so by comparing the mode frequencies of waves going in these opposite directions, you can determine how fast the gas is moving that's carrying the waves with it. And so by using this technique in fairly generalized ways, people are now able to deduce a great deal about how the sun is moving in its interior. Because it's all gas, it doesn't have to move at the same rate. And so we can determine how the dynamical structure of the sun is actually configured. Saturn's mass is higher than about 10 times the solar mass. Behave rather differently from the, uh, the sun. First of all, they're much brighter. Uh, and, and so even though they're more massive, they evolve faster and they live for maybe a hundred million years or less. And secondly, when they have used up all their fuel, and that happens through a number of nuclear reactions uh, in, in the sun, we think that the nuclear reactions uh, at the moment convert hydrogen into helium. Then as the sun grows old, the nuclear reactions can continue in the core of the sun. So helium can fuse into carbon and oxygen. But that's as, as far as it goes in a star like the sun. In these more massive stars, uh, this fusion of elements into heavier and heavier elements continue up to production of iron. And then the fusion processes stop and uh, eventually the core of the star collapses, re uh, releasing a huge amount of energy uh, in what we call a supernova explosion. And in, in that process, the, all the nuclear elements have been produced in the core of the star is spread in the interstellar space and then might be used in the formation of new stars and new planets. And so what we believe has happened is that in the original universe uh, created in, in the Big Bang, there was only hydrogen and helium and very small amounts of other elements. Here uh, in Leuven, let's say, we study uh, massive stars. So these are born with more uh, mass than the sun, and they live uh, quite a different life than the sun. And so the, the most important thing that we discovered, let's say, the past uh, two decades, you could say, is how stars rotate in their interior. Huh? So the gaseous layers, they rotate around uh, the central core, and uh, we have been able to measure that rotation, which is quite different from the surface rotation. Huh? You only see the surface of the star, but thanks to the stellar oscillations, we can understand how they rotate in their interior. And so we are mapping that out now, thanks to the space missions that give us sufficient data to unravel that for many stars. But now in the future is the next stage, because once you know how a star rotates in its interior, you also can get a better handle on how the chemicals mix inside the star. And so chemical mixing, as we call it, is really determining how the stars live their life in a much better way than when you don't know anything about this chemical mixing. And so our next step is to use the information and the knowledge on the stellar rotation that we have gained the past few years and to try to use that to exploit in more detail the properties of the stellar oscillations and uh, to derive uh, the mixing properties of the chemistry of the star. The more materials mix, uh, the longer the nuclear fusion can keep going inside the star. So this is really the crucial thing if you want to get good stellar ages. And stellar ages, of course, they determine how long the stars live. And when a star dies, it gives away its, en its, its energy very violently in, in the stars that we are studying. But it also gives its chemicals that it created during its life back to the galaxy and that then makes new stars and so they get richer and richer in metals. Now if you think of that as human beings like we are here thanks to a lot of metals that we have here on our planet and also oxygen and nitrogen uh, etc. So the chemical evolution of the Milky Way is really made thanks to the stars. And so if we understand better 
how long they need to do that to make these materials and to give them back, then the, the chemistry cycle of the Milky Way uh, will become way better determined. And that is really uh, of, of vital importance if you want to understand how our universe evolves, but also how life on possible exoplanets in our Milky Way would come to be or not. Please welcome on stage Connie Clara Ertz, Jörn Christensen Dalsgård, and Roger Ulrich. Yes, to see the scope of the work these scientists that carry out is just incredibly exciting and humbling. Their entire lives revolve around a dedicated research. Yes, as we've just seen, there's no doubt they have advanced scientific research and strengthened the relationship between science and society. To elaborate on Kavli Foundation's vision in honoring scientific achievements, Please welcome on stage the president of the Kavli Foundation, Rockel Hankin. Your Majesty. Catholic laureates, honored guests, it is an honor to be here today with all of you, and it has been my great privilege to be part of the Calvary Prize since its inception. Our founder and benefactor, Fred Calvary, believed that science, and especially basic science, improved the human condition over time by satisfying our innate curiosity, improving our understanding of nature, leading to breakthroughs that improve our lives. In other words, by making a difference. And we see this difference in the incredible research of the Kavli Prize laureates we honor here today. The Kavli Foundation also endeavors to make a difference. For 22 years, we focused on realizing Fred Kavli's vision to advance science for the benefit of humanity. Our mission, is to stimulate basic research in astrophysics, nanoscience, neuroscience, and theoretical physics to strengthen the relationship between science and society and to honor scientific achievements with the Kavli Prize. The Kavli Foundation continues to evolve while maintaining fidelity to its mission. Most recently, we endowed another Kavli Institute, this time at the University of Oxford, the Kavli Institute for Nanoscience Discovery, 
This is the fifth institute in nanoscience and the seventh outside the United States. The 20 Kavli Institutes we have endowed continue to address some of the most fundamental challenges in their science. We established the Kavli Centers for Ethics, Science, and the Public at the University of California, Berkeley, and at Cambridge University. Their focus is on addressing an unmet need within science, a proactive and sustained effort to connect scientists, ethicists, social scientists, science communicators, and the public to discuss potential impacts of scientific discoveries. We sponsored proceedings to think about science's endless frontiers and design its future architecture. We are grateful for the opportunity to make a difference. And we are also grateful to Norway and its people, its Ministry of Education and Research, its National Academy of Science and Letters, and His Majesty for their role in honoring the Havley Prize laureates, scientists who have made and continue to make a difference. As chairman of the Kavli Foundation, I too congratulate our laureates. With all of you, I look forward to an incredible future enhanced by the gifts of humankind's <coughs> scientific enterprise. No matter where one chooses to go in life, the journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step, as the old saying goes. We will now meet three young musicians, three siblings who have set out on their journey. A journey into the world of music. It's an honor for us to present Alma, Hector, and Franz Serafin Kragerud.
And now, on to our third and final category, neuroscience, which I would argue is probably the most complex area in all of science, because it deals with the most complex structure in the universe, the human brain. The four laureates of this year's Kavli Prize in neuroscience are honored for pioneering the discovery of genes underlying a range of serious brain disorders. Understanding inherited brain disorders has been made possible by the novel genetic approaches developed by this year's laureates. This in turn had led to improved care for patients and their families. Jean-Louis Mandel is a key contributor to the discovery that a repeated genetic sequence accounts for the pattern of inheritance in what's known as Fragile X syndrome a major cause of intellectual disability. His work has led to the development of widely used diagnostic tools and provided a model for numerous neurological diseases. Huda Sogby discovered the mutation in the gene MECP2 that caused Rett syndrome, a devastating motor and cognitive condition which develops in young girls. And Huda Zogby, together with Harry Orr, independently discovered Ataxin 1, the gene underlying a neurodegenerative disease called spinocerebellar ataxia type 1, which causes loss of balance and coordination. Christopher Walsh identified genetic mutation that underlie disorders affecting the cerebral cortex. This include adverse sporadic and somatic cell mutation in the developing brain. Many of these discoveries came from one of Walsh's key innovation to study recessive mutation in geographically isolated families. You know, Gri, being among so many wonderful scientists reminds me of the great uh, Russian-born American writer and biochemist Isaac Asimov. He once said, the saddest aspect of life right now is that science gathers knowledge faster than society gathers wisdom. Mm. Yes, <laughs> I think that's more true today than ever before. But I think all of us here are inspired and uh, inspired by the curiosity and dedication of all these inspirational scientists. We can all have much to learn from them. Let's meet the four Kavli laureates in neuroscience 2022. The brain requires a lot of genes to get put together. We have about 20,000 genes in total in our genome, and the brain uses almost half of them. Uh, and so uh, that creates a lot of potential problems because if almost any one of those genes is not working properly, we can develop disorders of the brain like intellectual problems or cognitive problems. Our intellectual cognitive abilities, language, writing, speech, is much different than our non-human primate ancestors. And that's due to changes in the DNA that then impact the function and complexity of the brain. But along with that are changes in DNA that causes diseases. There are many types of mutations and we have a long way to understand the effect of most of them. We've had better success in identifying the mutations that impair genes because that's obvious got someone who suffers from a disease and you study their DNA and you found a mutation, you can relate that to the cause. But we have a long way to, to identify as many mutations as possible that actually might confer protection and might improve health. Function of the ataxin-1 gene, its primary function is to encode and produce, give the inf genetic information for the ataxin-1 protein. And when we talk about function of the gene, what we're really talking about in genes like ataxin-1 is we're talking about the function of the protein. 
And that's one of the major questions that we have, have tried to address over the years is because we think the function, the normal function, if you will, of the ataxin-1 protein is very much linked to the molecular aspects of why the mutation in that protein then causes the disease, spinal cerebellar ataxin type 1. And what we know so far is that an important function of the ataxin-1 protein is to regulate gene expression in a variety of cell types, not just the brain, but also some of the muscle and, and uh, other tissues in the body. And we're what we're trying to understand is why certain neurons are more susceptible to the mutation that disrupts that function or alters that function than other cells. And uh, that's an interesting biological question, but also perhaps in the root of answering that question it might give us better information of how to counteract the negative aspects of the disease-causing mutation in the gene slash protein. But at this time, we're focusing on the nucleus of the cells and regulation of gene expression in terms of its function. In 2003, the Human Genome Project determined that each human has six billion letters in its DNA three billion base pairs inherited from their parents. Each time we conceive a child, out of the six billion letters, there are actually about 60 that will change from parents to the child. Most of them have no effect. Some may have very mild effects, good or bad. And rarely, but not so rarely, it can lead to a dysfunction in a gene that is very important for the brain function. Many of them are not transmitted. Some of them are transmitted. Fragile X can be transmitted in a pretty bizarre way. But because there are new mutations happening at each generation, each time we conceive a new human, then it will stay this, this background of uh, people with such mutation, and this is something we cannot really prevent unless the only way would be to sequence uh, in um, uh, every uh, fetus and then uh, not keep uh, those who have mutation that we can identify as very bad. But this would uh, uh, pose both ethical questions uh, because we don't always un uh, understand what a mutation effect is uh, and of course for the moment it's not uh, feasible or desirable. I think one interesting area that we're aiming for is to try to understand how the development of our brain predisposes us to various uh, disorders that might develop much later in life. So at the moment we know enough to know that the development of the brain uh, can predispose to certain conditions that affect a child, like focal epilepsy or intellectual disability or autism spectrum disorders. We also know that there are roles for genes in creating other disorders that present late in life, like degenerative conditions or Alzheimer's disease. What we don't yet know, and I think we might understand more about soon, is how the pattern of development also contributes to what happens later in life. Not just the genes, but in fact, these exposures and so forth that can also uh, alter our genome in a way that happens uh, independent of what we inherit. I work on childhood neurodevelopmental disorders. In particular, one such disorder is called Rett syndrome. And that disease shows up much earlier in life. It typically shows up in the second year of life, uh, where the babies lose the skills they used to do and cannot speak and cannot learn new things and will not use their hands anymore. They will wring their hands and they have balance problem, but it's because of changes in the function of the brain early on. That disease is very different from the ataxia because it's only one in a family. The ataxia, I told you, it passed from generation to generation, so you have many affected individuals. In the case of Red syndrome, there'll be a couple who will have a child who's healthy, and then the next child may have Rett syndrome. Or maybe another couple, their first child will have Rett syndrome, but then they have other healthy children. 
So it's just one in a family, but it's sporadic. It's not inherited. Parents are healthy, child is affected, because in the sperm, in one sperm, out of the many, many healthy sperms that that father carries, one sperm will have a mutation. And if that sperm gets fertilized and becomes an embryo and then a child, that will bring on Rett syndrome. So this is a class of disorders which are genetic, but not inherited. So it's still caused by a gene, but it's a random mutation that happens. Please welcome on stage Huda Zogby, Harry Orr, Jean-Louis Mandel, and Christopher Walsh. So, Jim, this was the last awards. We are coming to the end of this beautiful ceremony. Sadly, yes, but what an incredible afternoon we've had. We now have one final musical tribute to all of the winners. And I know this is one of your own Norwegian favorites, Gri. Yes, Sondre Lerke is a favorite to many of us Norwegians. He's uh, actually based in Los Angeles, California, so we are so grateful to have him here in Oslo this evening. So uh, please give a warm welcome to Sondre Lerke. That's all there is, a stream of captures that look you are the sunset backwards, your lips on mine, our faces backlit, that foreign sign, how we misread it. It has not been long enough Catching up with you again Catching up is everything Every moment nears an end Let's not wait so long again That's all there is Some days we had it That thing you said The way you said it your secret smile will always kill me. Now 
that's all there is A finest heartbeat That's all there is Catching up with you again Catching up is everything Every moment nears an end All there is That's all there is A stream of capture Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome on stage the president of the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters, Lina Evros. Your Majesty, Excellencies, Minister, Deputy Mayor, laureates, and friends of science. Today, we are delighted to honor scientists who have pursued their convictions and made breakthrough discoveries. The knowledge they have provided makes us understand more of the world we live in. Today, we have a better understanding of your brilliant achievements. The prize winners have made observations and performed experiments, followed by an intellectual tour de force. They have made new facts and data comprehensible and linked them to the knowledge that we already have. This new information expands our knowledge to the benefit of all of us. The best proof that scientific development has a great benefit to us all all the last years during the pandemic. In this Kavli Prize week, we should remind ourselves that we do not know what, when and where the next challenge will be. And therefore, we must be prepared for a crisis that might affect the society at large. We need to remember the importance of curiosity-driven basic research. This is the platform for which we rapid advances are made when we need it. COVID-19 is indeed a tragedy, but at the same time, an unparalleled showcase of the value of high quality scientific research. The scientific community also has a challenge in maintaining our commitment to true knowledge. We live in a new heyday of anti-science activism with climate change deniers and the anti-vaccination movement, unfortunately, still endures. In light of this, we are extremely thankful to our selection committees. They have a very important task in selecting our laureates. They make sure that the science we honor fulfills all the criteria of quality and reproducibility that is core to the science process. Thank you all. 
The Kavli Prize are meant to attract attention and show the public how important scientific activity is for our society and its future. We are especially hopeful that new generations will be inspired by the work of our laureates and that they will follow in their footsteps, build on their discoveries and promote true knowledge. With these words, I would like to thank you all for contributing to the Kavli Prize Week and once again, a big congratulation to all our Kavli Prize laureates. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain seated, but welcome on stage all our laureates for a final round of applause. I said remain seated. <laughs> yeah. Look at that. So, ladies and gentlemen, you're already standing, so. Please rise for His Majesty, the King of Norway. for being with us this afternoon. It has been a great pleasure. We hope you've all enjoyed yourselves as much as we have, and maybe you have left learning something new about the world. Thank you all, and goodbye.